The first movie begins in a dark and dilapidated facility, where a nurse of some sorts is administering artificial semen to a woman. Oh, God. Here we go again. Here we go again. After the procedure is done, a guard arrives there, puts the woman in chains, and rudely takes her away. Along the way, she notices other women held in captivity, with pipes attached to their chests. It appears as if the facility is harvesting milk from the women. Following this, the woman, whose name is revealed to be Lisa, is locked inside a cage. Her hands are then tied to the fence, making sure she is not able to move an inch. There are several other women in the room as well, most of which have lost their sanity due to the abuse they've been receiving day in and day out. For instance, they are zapped or beaten up from time to time by the guards. No one knows how they came here or where this place is. The only thing they do know is that they have to get out of here. By but it is not an easy task. One night, a woman suddenly goes into labor and starts screaming at the top of her lungs. Lisa tries to comfort her from the other cell, but it doesn't work. Soon, the guards, along with the nurse, arrive and take her out of the cell. They then force her to deliver the child, causing her excruciating pain. After a lot of struggle, a baby boy is taken out. But before the woman can see him, he is dumped into the bin and killed. Oh my god. Oh my god. Game of Thrones has nothing on this. It turns out these captors only keep the girls, because their main aim is to harvest milk from them. If a boy is born, he is immediately disposed of. After they leave, the devastated mother begs Lisa to choke her and end her suffering, but the latter is hesitant. Another night, a woman is seen lying unconscious on the floor. One of the guards arrives there and orders her to get up, but as expected, she is too weak to respond. Enraged, he grabs her forcefully and takes her to another room possibly to kill her. Lisa watches all of this go down and becomes terrified. She fears that she will never make it out of this place alive. However, with the days passing, she loses her sense of fear and starts plotting an escape plan. One day, she fakes having a contraction and lures a guard towards her, and as soon as he opens the door, she delivers a surprise kick to his head, knocking him out. Lisa is the Chuck Norris of boob farmers. The other women are exhilarated by the attack, and they start chanting for Lisa. So, with vengeance in her eyes, she takes the guard's knife and finishes him off with it. Lisa then takes his keys and proceeds to free all the women. But right then, she hears someone approaching and hides behind the door. It is another guard, who has arrived to check what is causing the commotion. When he sees his friend's lifeless body on the floor, he is taken aback. Suddenly, Lisa attacks him from behind with a metal chain and eventually strangles him to death. Lisa is the Bruce Willis of Boo farmers. She then hands the keys to one of the women and finally exits the place. Outside, Lisa comes across a long corridor with several doors on both sides. As she peeks through each of them, she sees some gut-wrenching scenes. Through one door, she witnesses a guard brutally killing a woman, while through another, she sees hundreds of unconscious women strapped to chairs. Pipes are fitted to their chests, and milk is being pumped out of them. Horrified, Lisa immediately exits the room and enters the next one, where she comes across a scared looking girl. It appears as if she was born in the facility to one of the victims. Lisa tries to comfort the girl, saying that she will rescue her. But right then, a guard arrives and takes her away. In the next scene, when Lisa wakes up, surprisingly, she notices the guard lying in a pool of his own blood. Turns out, the woman she had freed earlier got hold of a knife and killed him. The two women then regroup and start devising a plan to escape. They know that it is going to be an extremely difficult task, which might result in their demise. But, seeing the desperate conditions inside the facility, they are willing to take that risk. Anything is better than the booby farm. Right then, the nurse from earlier enters the room to check up on her patients. When her back is turned, the two women grab hold of her and forcefully cut her tongue out. Why? They then lock her inside one of the cages, making sure she can neither escape nor scream. In the final scene, we learn the actual purpose of the facility. Turns out they harvest milk from women to manufacture a beauty cream product called Lactic Vitae. This product promises to revitalize one's skin in just a matter of hours, something which their competitors cannot. I've heard this is also how McDonald's makes McFlurries. Good luck ever looking at a McFlurry again the same way. <laughs>
<laughs> this movie was based on real life events. Oh, oh no. Millions of cows are slaughtered all across the world, but the manner in which they are treated is inhumane. They are forcefully brought to a camp. They are artificially inseminated. They are given very little food and always beaten up and abused. Their male calves are immediately discarded. And finally, they are executed when they cannot produce any more milk. The herd depicts the brutal way in which they are treated, using female humans as an example. At the start of the second movie, we are introduced to a couple, Ben and Rachel. They are cooking dinner together while talking about different things. Suddenly, there is a knock on the door. The couple is shocked because they weren't expecting anyone at this time of night. Ben asks Rachel to keep cooking and walks towards the window. On seeing the person, his entire demeanor changes and the excitement from a few seconds ago leaves his face. Outside stands a guy holding the gift box and a grim expression on his face. Ben recognizes him as someone named Sean. He tells Rachel about Sean's arrival, which surprises her as well. She states that she doesn't want to see him, so Ben takes it upon himself to deal with the uninvited guest. Hey buddy, knock knock. Piss off, Sean. Sean awkwardly greets him and asks if it was a bad time to come to the house. It was most definitely a bad time, but Ben asks him to come inside just to be polite. Sean enters the house and looks around awkwardly, thinking of a way to hand Ben the gift box when there is no special occasion. He asks if Rachel is around and when Ben says no, he breathes a sigh of relief. As they talk, we find out that they had a conflict some time ago, and were not on good terms. They haven't talked since the incident, hence Sean's sudden arrival was surprising to the couple. After some seconds of awkwardly talking about the interior of the house, Sean apologizes for what he did when they last met. He then finally acknowledges the box in his hands and says that it is a gift from his side. Ben takes the box, still unsure what is the point of the gift. They have nothing else to talk about, so he politely asks the guest if he wants something to drink. After Sean declines, they fall into complete silence. Having had enough of the awkwardness, Ben bluntly asks him if he is okay. The guy says he is doing great, but asks Ben to open the presents in front of him. Oh god. Don't do it, Ben! Don't do it, buddy! Without asking many questions, Ben sits down to open it. He tries to read the letter first, but Sean claims that the letter would only make sense after looking at the gift. So, Ben tears the poorly wrapped paper and opens the box. To his surprise, he sees nothing inside. Not because the box is empty, but because it is too dark to look inside. Confused as to how it is possible, Ben turns the box around, but no matter the lighting, he cannot see what is inside of it. He asks Sean what the box is, but gets no reply. Instead, the shady guy runs away from the house hurriedly. After he leaves, Rachel comes inside and asks him what happened, but Ben is too busy trying to figure out the box. He brings out a flashlight and flashes it into the box, but even then the content are not visible. Following that, Ben brings out a pencil and drops it into the box, but it makes no noise at all. It is almost as if the box is a tunnel that leads somewhere. The couple looks at it in confusion, not sure what they should do next. Ben tries to put his hand inside, but Rachel stops him because it doesn't seem safe. Just then, Ben remembers the card that he received with the box. He opens it and reads a letter addressed to him by Sean. In the letter, Sean apologizes for everything that has happened between them and claims that he has to give the box to someone else. He also asks Ben to not take his eyes off the box at any cost, because when he is not looking, it moves. The couple is confused as to how a box can move, but just then, the pencil from earlier rolls over to Ben's feet. When he looks back at the box, to his utmost horror, a person is peeking from inside it. Oh, I just got goosebumps. The couple is terrified. They look at each other and try to communicate with the person, but he does not speak. He simply stares at them with sweat dripping down his face. Ben quickly calls Sean, but it goes straight to voicemail. Meanwhile, Rachel realizes that the stranger hasn't taken his eyes off Ben for the entire time. She inquires what the person wants, but her husband is as clueless as she is. Scared, Ben calls Sean again, but while he is at it, he hears Rachel ask the same question. This this is when it finally dawns on him that the box is making him hear things. Everything that he said some seconds ago is being repeated in his head. Worried that the stranger may attack any time, Ben takes his keys, ready to drive away with Rachel. However, when he calls to her, 
She doesn't move. She says that they are always supposed to watch the box, according to the letter. So, leaving it unattended could be dangerous. Just to see what happens when they look away, they turn towards each other for a few seconds. When they look back, the man has his hands on the box, implying that he is trying to come out. So, Ben asks Rachel to be with the box while he goes to Sean's place. <laughs> Fuck you, Ben. You do it. He makes her sit on a chair and hands her a knife for protection. Although the task is a scary one, Rachel bravely takes her place and waits for Ben to return. In the next scene, Ben finally connects to Sean over the phone and explains that the box is telling them things and a person is coming out of it. Sean is shocked because he didn't know the box could speak and the only reason he gave it to Ben was because he thought Rachel wasn't around. When he finds out that Ben has left Rachel alone with the box, he freaks out. It is then revealed that since the box was gifted to Ben, it doesn't move only when he is watching it. Realizing that his wife is in danger, Ben quickly turns the car around and drives home. Sean from the other side yells at him not to go back, but Ben doesn't listen. When he finally gets home, the room is dark and the light switch is broken. Using a flashlight, he looks around and sees that the box is missing and Rachel is nowhere to be seen. He opens the basement door and calls for her. She replies from the bedroom and sounds completely normal. When she stops talking, Ben slowly makes his way downstairs and into the bedroom. But, to his surprise, the room is empty. Then, he hears a noise from the bathroom and carefully goes in to check. He sees the guy from the box, who is now out in the open. Ben tries to maintain eye contact, but looks away startled by a noise. The stranger disappears in a split second and he is left alone. Ben quickly tries to run upstairs, but sees shadows of some people coming down to towards him. They stop moving when he looks at them, just like the stranger from the box. On the other side of the hallway is the stranger, who also walks towards Ben. Since he cannot look in both directions at once, they eventually catch up to him, and the screen goes black. Lesson learned, never accept boxes from dudes named Sean. The third movie starts in a serene environment where half-eaten food and drinks are spilled nearby. It appears as if someone was forcefully taken away from there. There is also a pond in the area, which turns out to be a popular swimming spot for locals. Sometime later, a chubby-looking cute girl arrives there with excitement in her eyes. She is looking forward to taking a swim in this sweltering heat, but she is also self-conscious about her appearance, prompting her to look around and check if anybody is nearby. After the girl concludes that she is the only one there, she changes into her swimwear and proceeds towards the pond. However, just as she is about to dive in, a middle-aged man pops out of the water. The two stare at each other for a while, unsure of what to do. Right then, three bullies show up on the nearby bridge and start teasing our protagonist, calling her Piggy. They relentlessly torment her appearance and body structure, forcing her to dive into the water and hide. However, even they there, the bullies don't stop taunting her. The shady looking man watches all of this go down, but he doesn't do anything and simply gets out of the pond. Surprisingly, we see a lifeless corpse inside the pond, completely tied with chains. It is evident that the man is responsible for this. After a while, when the girl resurfaces from the water, believing that she is out of danger, the bullies suddenly start attacking her with a fishing net. They even take pictures of her and upload them to the internet. The attack turns out to be so brutal that the girl starts bleeding from her nose, but fortunately, she manages to swim away. When she reaches the other side of the pond, the bullies also prepare to leave, believing that they have successfully completed their douchebag mission. But, unfortunately for our protagonist, they take all of her clothes and mobile phone with them. In the next scene, the girl frantically gets out of the water and tries calling out for help, but no one is around. So, she is forced to go all the way home in her swimsuit, drenched in water. To make matters worse, she doesn't find her shoes, making her arduous journey even more difficult. Still, determined to make it home, the girl starts running in the scorching sun. When she reaches the highway, a group of arrogant boys follow her and call her by the same name. Piggy! A few of them even grab her and make her feel very uncomfortable. When the situation gets out of hand, the girl takes a detour and rushes into the woods. Her eyes are full of tears, and her heart is pounding in fear. She is fed up with the constant bullying she suffers because of her appearance. As she ventures deeper into the woods, suddenly, the man from the swimming pool shows up. He is carrying something heavy with him, wrapped in plastic, possibly another corpse. The girl is terrified and starts running away. 
away. But the man gets into his car and follows her. Soon he stops next to her and stares at her through the window, menacingly. Then a bloody hand suddenly emerges from the back seat. It belongs to none other than one of the bullies who was tormenting her girl earlier. The bully appears to be beaten badly and she cries out for help. This time, she even calls the girl by her real name, Sarah. However, Sarah is too shocked to respond. As she stands there in disbelief, the man drops her stuff from the window, which the bullies had taken earlier. This reveals that he has finished off the other two already. The movie ends as Sarah nervously thanks the man for his help, and he too waves at her. As for the bully, she keeps screaming for help, but Sarah refuses. Who's the piggy now, bitch? <laughs> Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.